many of you know, last year we had Elliot come and talk to us, and you say, well, why do we want a repeat performance? <laughs> well, Elliot has a rather unique position, being the um, executive, uh, chief executive officer for the Space Foundation. He's been that since 2001, so he's now, I think, qualified in the job finally. <laughs> but more importantly, he's one of these few individuals that gets the opportunity to continually monitor and see all the pieces that are occurring as it relates to the space enterprise. And because it has so many pieces, there are very few that can put these together in a way that can cause action to help that enterprise over time. And as you heard, one of the key elements of that that he'll talk, I'm sure, a little bit about today is the footprints that we want to leave in young people's minds in order for them to see the need and the opportunities that the space system is, offers. And as you heard from General Hyten yesterday, his ability to have a dialogue with Werner von Braun was a, was a key life-setting incident. And the Space Foundation has that ch charter, has that done a tremendous amount in that area. But as with all things, you need a good orche orchestra leader. And sure enough, we find that in Elliot Pullum. So Elliot, we honor and, your and look forward to your opportunity to give us some more insight on things that are going on in the space endeavor. <clears throat> There's your clicker right there. Thanks. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to see so many people in the room here. Um, and nice to have the numbers back up and the energy back up. Congratulations, Sandy and Jeannie and the whole team. This is really wonderful. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the rest of the world having to do with space and try and paint a global context and a global picture. Uh, and I'm going to do something a little different that I don't normally do, which is I'm going to look forward about 10 years and try and, and extrapolate from where we are to where we might be in 10 years' time to give us some idea of, of the things that are going to be driving us forward uh, as we go ahead. So the, uh, the data that you're going to see in here comes from this uh, publication, the Space Report. Uh, this is a report that uh, the Space Foundation puts out every year. Uh, we develop all the data from the industry around the world, publish it in this, uh, in this book. Um, for those of you that don't do paper anymore, that's fine. It's available online. You can go to our website, order a paper copy, order access to the electrical version, uh, get into the database, site licenses, whatever you want. We're happy to share this data with you because there's a lot of good data in here. So what does the uh, global space economy look like, at least in, in 2013? Uh, continuing to grow uh, as it has been since we started putting this report together. I think what's surprising to a lot of people is that the, uh, the commercial part of this continues to grow faster and faster and become more and more dominant uh, as part of the total uh, activity going on around the world. So if you look at that uh, measured in U.S. dollars, uh, $314 billion worth of activity in 2013. The vast majority of that, as you can see, is in commercial space products and services, commercial infrastructure and support industries, and then followed by the government spending. And you can see in uh, 2013, the uh, U.S. government uh, accounted for about 13 percent of the global spend, and all other governments accounted for about 11 percent. Now, when we get later in the presentation, we're going to talk about the trends and some of the ways that that is being jeopardized and what that might mean for all of us going forward as we try and plan our activities. But it's, uh, it's uh, very informative, the role that commercial plays here. And I think it's something that we should pay attention to in our discussions here this week as we talk about SSA and, and other factors uh, that are primarily we're looking at in a military context is all the commercial players that depend upon this data and that want to help in obtaining and sharing this data it is very important to them, to their bottom line, and to their continued existence as businesses. Uh, this is the model that we used. A lot of people wonder, how do you collect all that data? Uh, we started slicing and dicing the space industry just like you would any mature industry. We look at what are the products and services, what's the turnover, where's the value added being created. 
And so you see from left to right all these categories, and within each category, looking at, uh, as Natalie said, both the stuff that's in space, but also the stuff that's on the ground that either drives the stuff or delivers the stuff from space. And so you have your, your, your ground services, your, your, uh, uh, all of you have got your GPS uh, uh, ground station in your phone, your little GPS chipset, and all those types of things that drive manufacturing, which drive these dollar numbers up uh, for the industry on a global basis. And I realize it's an eye test. <clears throat> so where are things going? Uh, right now. Uh, for the most part, pretty good. If you look at the commercial infrastructure piece, we're building more and more stuff, churning out more and more portable mobile satellite ground stations for your cars, for your cell phones, and for all these types of devices. If you look at the applications, Google Earth, and all the things that are going on there using space data, space imagery, sky is the limit, not the limit, commercial products and services, yeehaw, it's right raging off the charts. And then you get to the government piece. And what's really concerning about this government piece is that the downward trend is being driven almost entirely by the US government. Most other governments are on the ups upswing, but the US downswing is so severe, it's driving the world total down. And that should be something of great concern to all of us going forward. Uh, here's a little bit of uh, detail on how that works out. These are uh, analysis of the government uh, space budgets around the world. And so you see the US in 2013 was down 9.4%. Uh, that is very alarming. It is historic. Uh, it's something we need to pay attention to and try and arrest. It's something certainly my organization spends a lot of time in Washington trying to address. And especially if you look in the context of what other countries are doing, you know, the European Space Agency was up 6.5%. Look at Canada was up 40%. Uh, India up 40%. Uh, Russia up you know, almost 30%. South Korea 50%. United Kingdom 100%. Although in fairness, for the United Kingdom to be up 100%, it's less important if you measure how many dollars that went up. But as a percentage, it's pretty serious. And, and I do have another chart about the UK uh, later in the, in the presentation. But this is the trend of other countries either increasing or in some cases starting fresh space programs while we are continuing to trim uh, what we're doing as a country. And that jeopardizes our leadership in a lot of ways. And I say that not just as an American concerned about American leadership, but also because the international community really looks to us to lead because we have been the leaders for so long. And when we fail to lead, it creates a vacuum in leadership. It creates uncertainty with our allies. And so this is a, a, a global concern going forward. And I thought what I'd do just for fun is to look at launchers, uh, because we don't look at this very often, because it is a pretty small part of the piece. Very important part of the puzzle. If you don't have a launcher, you don't have a space program. Um, but in terms of what uh, you know, the global measure on uh, spending is, it, it's not a very high percentage. But I think it's interesting to see how much effort goes into this small part of the puzzle. Uh, in the US in 2013, we had 12 uh, active launchers, and you can see them there from left to right, from Pegasus all the way up to Falcon 9 version 1.1. And on those 12 launchers, we did 19 missions in 2013. Uh, if you look at the Russian uh, stable. They had eight active launchers in 2013, upon which they did 31 launches. If you look at the Chinese stable of launch vehicles, seven active launch vehicles in 2013, 15 launches. It's a lot of launch vehicles, isn't it? Other launchers, Europe with the Vega, the Soyuz, the Ariane 5, uh, Japan, India, South Korea, and then the land launch and sea launch, which are kind of interesting one-offs. Uh, but again, 12 active launchers in that category, 16 launches. So if you total that up, the smoke and fire, shock and awe part of this business, we had 39 total launch vehicles out there chasing after 81 launches. So round that up, that's about two missions per vehicle, which is tough to build a business base on and you might wonder why launching is so expensive. It's hard to get a, a good rate of campaign going. It's hard to get 
efficiencies of manufacturing going when you have this level of competition. Um, and the money that was spent was uh, $6.73 billion, which sounds like a lot of money, and it is. I'd take it. Um, but when you, uh, when you split it between 39 vehicles and then realize it was actually down 3% from the year before, uh, and that the commercial component of that, to I think a lot of people's surprise, was down 21%, um, you've got an interesting business there. It's the business we all rely on. It's the business we can't do without, but it's only 2% of the global revenue, and so it's hard to get the kind of focus on it that we need to improve uh, our ability to launch things. And yet you do see a lot of focus on this, and I know there's one of these, this is a test, one of these does not belong, remember in your readers? Uh, but it's such a cool picture and a cool vehicle, and it's from Colorado, so I like to keep it in there, and that's the, the dream chaser. Uh, but look at all the stuff that's going on trying to bring the launch costs down. You've got the Ariane 6 there in the center, and uh, We've got France and Germany here in the room. You guys can go duke it out about RAN5 versus RAN6. I know there's a big battle brewing there. But a lot of investment going into that. You've got the Skylon program going on in the UK. You've got, uh, oh, um, Sir Richard with his uh, Virgin, uh, Virgin Galactic uh, developments, uh, including something called Launcher 1, which is a satellite launcher that goes from this thing as opposed to his uh, standard tourism. Uh, vehicle with the, with the, with the uh, Spaceship 2. Uh, you've also got up in the upper left-hand corner something called Strato Launch, which is, again, Paul Allen uh, and his folks up in Seattle, uh, teamed with uh, Orbital Sciences, or whatever they're going to be called once they come out of the merger. Um, so there's a lot of investment, despite the fact that this is really small. And why is that? I, I think there's two reasons for that. One of them is, even though it's really small in terms of the percentage of our business, $6 billion is not a bad business base. And so if, if you can make a breakthrough here and corner a big part of this market, it's worth your investment to do that. But I also think there's something fundamental about those of us in this business wanting to get this business ahead. And it's been the holy grail in this business for as long as I've been here, if we can only get the launch costs down. And I still believe that that's right, and I think these people believe that that's right. If we can get the launch cost down to a fraction of what it is, the markets that we have today, you ain't, you ain't seen nothing yet uh, if we can get these launch costs down. And I think that's why you see so much effort uh, going into this. It's the emotional as well as the business case. So where are we going with, with this business? Um, obviously, satellites are getting smaller, yes? Yes? No? This is a, uh, a picture of Nigeria Sat 1 uh, being manufactured at Surrey Satellite in Guildford, England. Anybody else been to the Surrey factory and seen them? Is that not an impressive deal that they've got there? Uh, and as you can see, the scale here with the technician uh, standing there, the technician is just about as tall, maybe a little taller than this satellite. Um, a 300 kilogram satellite, very highly capable satellite. Uh, pretty neat. So satellites are definitely getting smaller, or are they? This is, uh, this is Anik G1, and you can see the scale of this satellite compared to the technician. And what's really interesting about this satellite is there is a ton of stuff on it. Even though it's going to geo, it's not going to geo for a single purpose. It has a direct-to-home broadcasting mission covering all of Canada. It has secure government comms packages on this covering Eastern Pacific and the Americas. It has broadband voice and data packages for South America, and there is a classified European military X-band capability on this satellite. That is a big satellite with a lot of capability, and it's going to geo, and that's because geo slots are so valuable that you're going to see and continue to see more and more and more capability put on these very large satellites. So yes, satellites are getting smaller. And no, satellites are getting bigger. If you look ahead 10 years in the satellite business alone, uh, we're looking at about 1,100 and a half satellites being manufactured, built and launched in the next decade. That's a lot. Uh, the launch manifest and the value of the satellites, probably $250 billion or thereabout. Interestingly enough, 
still about 75% government on these payloads. Um, the commercial guys tend to build cheaper satellites and they tend to last for a very long time. They will replenish. But if you consider the GPS replenishment, the Galileo being uh, launched and, and so forth, it's probably not all that surprising that a lot of the launch activity in the next decade is gonna be government launches. Uh, nanosats and CubeSats are going to become commodities. We're gonna be stamping them out like credit cards. They're gonna be very common, they're gonna be very cheap, and, and they're gonna become commoditized. Uh, and we'll talk about that as, uh, in a second. Um, but this, what I call a small-ish satellite, which is like the, uh, the Surrey satellites, they're really gonna command a sweet spot of capability and size and low expense and I think the, the companies that are able to do that well are going to continue to do very, very well in the marketplace, while the very large, exquisite satellites continue to dominate the, the geo band. A little more forecasting, a little Carnet crystal ball here for you. Um, Ten years from now, let's see, the NASA program of record will change about 2017. How do I know that? because there's a presidential election in 2016 and the politician has not been born that doesn't want their fingerprints on the NASA program when they go to the White House. This happens every presidential election. It's gonna happen again. Don't know what it means. Don't know how significantly the program will change. I hope not too much because we need to get out of the habit of throwing away billions of dollars worth of stuff every time we have an election. Uh, but you can count on it. There will be changes after the 2016 election. Uh, talked about space products becoming commoditized. Here's an interesting chart from the Space Report tracking um, trends in commercial satellite imagery. And look at the, the gap between archived imagery and specially tasked imagery coming down, down, down. You know, back in 2004, it was about five bucks for an archived image and nearly 40 bucks for a tasked image. Today, those, those have almost merged at about seven or eight bucks a pop. So this is going to be a, a commodity. And so when you look at some of the new systems coming out uh, that are, that are th talking about putting up 300 small satellites and generating all this imagery, I got to wonder where the business base is for that because the price per image has already come down so far that you're, you're getting to where you're having a real hard time building a business around doing this, uh, much less investing in hundreds more satellites to do it. I think and I hope that there is going to be a post-election pushback on defense budget cuts, which is where a large part of the U.S. decline in 2013 came from. Um, you know, Natalie talked about uh, the situation out there in that uh, barbaric part of the world. I think people are, as much as people are war-weary, I think people are finally understanding that this ain't over and it's not going to be over and we cannot sit and wait for another 9-11 before we wake up. Uh, so I'm hoping that after the histrionics and hysteria of the election campaign cycle here this autumn, that cooler heads will prevail. We'll go back, you know, the automatic cuts that are supposed to be triggered that are still in law, by the way, the, uh, the Budget Control Act nonsense. We need to take the country off of autopilot and start thinking and making decisions in a rational way to drive our, our, our defense picture so that we're taking care of, of what we need to take care of business-wise. Um, another piece of the forecast, 10 years from now, the space station picture is going to change. Uh, 10 years from now will be 2024. I did the math. I'm not a math major, but I can get that far. And. Uh, by all accounts at that point is when all known support for the International Space Station is supposed to run out. Um, there's some speculation it may run out sooner than that, and I'm not a geopolitical expert, I'm not ready to talk about Russia and, and all those things, but for sure by 2024, even in the best case scenario, International Space Station program support and funding runs out. And oh, by the way, this creature comes online. This is the China spa Chinese Space Station. And it's interesting, about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, uh, the Chinese first briefed this at a UN workshop in Beijing. Brian, you were there for this, I think, and uh, maybe Victoria as well. Uh, and I think we don't realize how transparent and open they have been about what they intend to do with this program. 
uh, how aggressively they've been out marketing it around the world, how many partners they've signed up for this, and oh, by the way, how good they are at building hardware. So this is going to be a new wrinkle, having a Chinese space station, a very large, very capable space station, and oh, by the way, probably the other wild car in here is a commercial space station and, and the work that Bob Bigelow and his folks are doing out in the desert outside of Las Vegas. So the space station picture is going to change in the next decade pretty dramatically as well. Also, more international, as we talked about investments being made, uh, more international emphasis, more programs being started in different parts of the country. The map in the upper left-hand corner there is a map of uh, Great Britain uh, that was released, let's say about a month ago, now July. Uh, this is uh, their preliminary scrub at spaceport development for Great Britain. They have identified eight sites. They're now going through a study very similar to the study that Hawaii has been doing for the past year. And they're going to scrub this list down and get to a preferred site and an investment package. And the UK Space Agency is all about investing to make commercial things happen. So keep your eye on these guys. Uh, below that, sort of the futuristic uh, looking campus with the ghosted image uh, of people in the long white flowing gowns. Uh, this is a, an artist concept of the campus of the Space Agency of the United Arab Emirates. And I don't know how many of you saw the announcement probably about two months ago about the UAE forming their space agency. Everybody see that? And what's their first mission? Going to Mars. Not with people yet. Um, they are very serious. They have plenty of money to invest in this. If you look at what they have done with their, their container shipping and global port operation investment strategy, what they've done with their global aviation strategy with Emirates Air and, and other things, this is a very, very serious, credible, and by the way, good thing. These guys are good allies and they're good players, uh, and this is going to bring something new to all of us, uh, so we need to keep our eyes on it. The launch vehicles in the upper right-hand corner, uh, this is kind of a fanciful drawing of two launch vehicles coming off the pad in very short order, which I don't think is a real good idea, but it makes for nice artwork. Uh, but this is, this, is, uh, this is from South Korea. Um, we participated in a bilateral with South Korea and the US uh, in Washington, DC about a month ago. And South Korea, as you saw in the earlier chart, is investing heavily. They have set their budget levels to rival the budget of the Japan Space Agency, JAXA. And it is their goal to actually be a vibrant rival to JAXA in the exploration and development of space. And if you watch the South Korean economy over the last 30 years and the dedication and commitment of their national enterprise, no reason to doubt that they're going to do this. Final picture is a group of Japanese astronauts, which is just to say that the Japanese space program is going to continue to evolve as well. They continue to make serious investments. They went through a serious period of increase here in the last uh, two to three years. Uh, right now, there is some political maneuvering. We're not sure how that's going to shake out in terms of where the ministry is going to report and what the eventual level of spending is going to be. But they are very, very good partners. They're very strong partners. They're very committed to the long term in space. And I think that they will continue to be important players over the next 10 years. So if you roll that all up, what do things look like 10 years from now? And the assumptions are on the chart, so you can see it's not totally crazy. But it's safe to assume that in 2024, this is going to be about a $600 billion industry, almost big enough to be noticed by political experts. Um, most of the, the growth will continue to be in the commercial side. And I've programmed in this about 8%, which is fairly conservative growth in this area has been between 7 and 13 percent consistently over the last seven years. The area for concern is the U.S. government spending and other government spending. I've assumed that we're going to roll back some of our stupidity and not continue to cut at 9 percent per year. But I've left in a 4 percent political idiocy factor and said, well, OK, so we're only going to decline by 4% per year using the miracle of compound interest. What does that get you to? It gets you to a number of 27.4 billion, or only 5% versus today's 13% of the global marketplace. And when you're at 5% and the rest of the industry is at some other astronomical number, uh, your leverage gets to be pretty small. 
as well as your programs get to be pretty small. So I think this is something we really have to work on as an industry. We have to support the Air Force. We have to support the Department of Defense. We have to all be active with our congressional delegation, delegations, wherever you're from, um, uh, to try and, and, and uh, keep this from happening. A little uh, political forecasting for you. Since we're here in Hawaii, I thought I'd start with the Hawaiian Islands. Um, these are the gubernatorial candidates. Um, the, uh, the gentleman on the, uh, the far right, yes, uh, Neil Abercrombie is out. Pretty stunning uh, if, you watch, if you're an election watcher. What does it mean for Hawaii and Hawaii's space efforts and space programs? Overall, it's a good thing. I don't know which of these other three gentlemen is going to win. If I did, I'd take my money and go to Vegas right now. Um, but you've got uh, uh, David Ige, uh, Duke Iona, and Mufi Hanneman. They are all technically friendly. I've had the chance to work with Ige in the legislature. He has been very pro-space. He's been very supportive of all the stuff that the Office of Aerospace Development has tried to get through the legislature. He would be a good governor for space for this state. Same with Duke Iona. You've got to love anybody's chances in this state whose name is Duke. That is a holy name. Um, and he was elected as a Republican, uh, which is you know, almost as absurd as unseating a Democratic governor who's sitting. Uh, so he might have some chances. Um, I did meet him and talk to him and work with him a little bit when he was in office. Very, very strong on space. Very strong. He's ready to create a new division and a new department and throw a big budget at this, so that would be good. Mufi Hanneman, his support for space goes back to the 80s when he was working at Sea Brewer and they were studying putting a spaceport in Kau, where I am from. And despite the fact that that went pretty much where you could have predicted it would go, Mufi has been technically friendly forever. Um, so I think the forecast here is that things will get better no matter which of these three gents makes it into office. On a national level, we've got some challenges coming up in the political arena. Uh, if you look at the Senate Armed Services Committee, very important to getting Air Force funded. Uh, Senator Levin is retiring. And depending on how the elections go, we could end up with Senator Reid or the other charming fellow um, as the chair of the Senate Armed Services Committee. Um, that's probably enough said on that one. Um, <laughs> On the uh, Senate uh, uh, Commerce, Science, Technology Committee, uh, Senator Rockefeller, who has been very steadfast in supporting NASA, is also retiring. If the Senate stays Democratic, then Senator Nelson from Florida would be the person to assume the chairmanship of that committee. Most of you know this is Senator Nelson's the only, uh, the only sitting member of Congress to have flown in space. He was a mission spe specialist when he was in the House. Uh, and, and uh, flew as a shuttle astronaut, uh, very, very pro-space kind of guy, uh, or Senator Thune, who has been on the committee and has also been very supportive. So I think on that committee, we're probably going to be okay no matter which way things go. And then you've got the, uh, the House uh, Commerce, Judicial, and Science Committee, chaired by uh, Representative Wolf. Um, he is retiring. Um, pros and cons there. I mean, he has been pretty good, pretty strong supporter of space programs. On the other hand, he's been a real pain in the butt, excuse me, pain in the okole, um, <clears throat> when it comes to our friends and colleagues in China. And my, my experience and my belief is that you accomplish a lot more with dialogue and engagement than you do with estrangement and name calling. And I think we have really missed the boat over the past decade in dealing with the folks in China. I'm not saying, you know, woo -hoo, throw open the cabinet and give, give away everything, but they are good and we're going to accomplish a lot more if we're talking to them. And, and I think this is something that's likely to improve uh, when uh, Representative Wolf retires. Uh, Representative Culberson on the Republican side, great guy, uh, strong, strong, strong supporter of space programs. Not clear if, uh, if the Democrats were to take the House who would be on that committee. But changes, as you can see, in three of the very key committees that we all have to watch every day as the business of the nation goes forward. Also changes around the world, and I'm just going just to point to Europe for a minute here. 
Um, the gentleman in the top center, Jean-Jacques Dordan, is going to be retiring uh, as the Director General of the European Space Agency uh, along about April, May. Uh, and he has been a steady hand. He has been a very uh, friendly, collaborative guy. He's been really great uh, for international collaboration. He's been a great leader of ESA. Don't know who his replacement's going to be. Uh, the, below him, a couple of possible candidates. Uh, uh, Jan Werner from uh, the German Space Agency, DLR, has already been nominated to take over as the ESA Director General. And of course, the Germanies, Germans have all been very vocal about supporting his candidacy. And uh, Dave Willits. Willits was the minister in the UK who had responsibility for the space and, and universities portfolio. He lost his job in July. I was actually there when there was a shakeup in the government. And he was replaced by this guy, Greg Clark, um, up in the upper left, left hand corner. Remains to be seen what kind of minister Clark is going to be. I'm very optimistic. I got to meet with him his first day on the job. He's, he's very excited, and he's under a lot of pressure because he has an 11-year-old daughter that wants to be an astronaut. <laughs> so back to the kids and how important the kids are. Um, and then Jean-Yves Legal uh, took over as uh, head of, uh, of the French space agency, uh, CNES, about six or eight months ago. And so it's remaining to be seen what kind of uh, imprint uh, that will have and what kind of changes that will make. But just to say, changes going on in Europe uh, as well. So that's kind of the, uh, the view from way up high of things going on all around the world. And uh, hopefully that helps put in the context the conversations and meetings and discussions we're going to be having this week. And I really appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to be here again with all of you. And, and I know, Kirk, if there's a question or two, I'm happy to have that as well. But thank you very much. We don't have time for questions. Okay, good. Is that be all right? Yep.